Well, thank you for coming to our presentation. This is socializing the elephant with the rest of the animals. So um, I don't know who came because of the elephants or the animals, or, uh, <laughs> or whether it was more um, big data or Ageria. Is, um, who is using Ageria at the moment? Who's intro is it mo mostly getting um, familiar with what Ageria is about? Is that what, what you're interested in? And uh, your roles, is it, is it information architecture? Is it developers? What sort of roles do you have? Database. D database. Yeah. Data engineering. OK. <laughs> OK, I'm just getting an idea. OK. So this is all about integrating big data with um, using Ageria. So we're going to talk about uh, the various styles which um, um, metadata has, has been represented and different ways of managing your information. We'll talk about an introduction to Ageria, and then we'll talk about how big data sits with these things and uh, how Ageria can integrate big data into, a, um, into the ecosystem. So my name is David Radley. I work for IBM. I'm um, an open source um, committer on Apache Atlas, and I'm a maintainer on Ageria, and I was one of the founders of the Ageria project. So this came about because IBM and Atruvia um, did a project around um, Ageria, and we, got, and we got them really well. Uh, we, we uh, created a lot of code that's now in production. So we're now jointly presenting around Ageria, and hopefully you'll see the magic of Ageria that we do. So uh, I'll, leave, I'll hand you over to Jürgen to introduce himself, and he's going to talk about um, the styles of managing information and a bit about Atruvia and IBM before I come back and then do this sort of introduction to Ageria. Okay, so over to Jürgen. Thank you, David. So welcome to our session. Um, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm Jürgen Hemelt. I'm, uh, yep, my role is called technical architect, uh, but I work in the enterprise architecture uh, department in our company. Oh, sorry. Um, um, a few words to my company, our company. Um, company is called Atruvia. I don't expect any one of you to know my company. It's a German company. Um, we are an IT service provider in Germany, and we provide a full service stack for uh, banks in, in uh, <coughs> Germany, so-called cooperative banks. Um, uh, we have, uh, in total, 800 customers, 800 uh, mostly cooperative banks, which we serve. Um, we have a core banking system, which we provide them. Um, we have, um, of course, all the analytics uh, services, uh, um, beginning with data warehouses uh, or uh, central data warehouses, uh, data lakes, and newer architectures. And I want to tell you uh, something about those architectures in the next few slides, just to um, let you see, uh, get, get an uh, impression of how... how uh, large or small we are, <laughs> depends on uh, what you think about it. So um, about 8,000 employees in the complete group and 1.7 billion euro revenue. Um, yes. Uh, why we work with Algeria? We are a, an IBM customer uh, and um, uh, one of the biggest customers, I think, in Germany from IBM. And uh, <clears throat> uh, as we are, we've been working on uh, metadata management and data governance, and we were looking for uh, technologies out there. And um, so we came to IBM, and IBM partnered with us, and IBM suggested at that point uh, we have, um, there is this open source project called Ageria, and um, y you can fulfill all your requirements with this, uh, especially requirements regarding GDPR uh, requirements. And, uh, compliance requirements um, <clears throat> with any other financial regulations. As you may know, um, we are uh, in the banking area, we are quite regulated, especially in Europe. I think in Europe it's even more than, than in the US or in Canada. 
Um, <clears throat> so we need this uh, transparency about the data, and um, that's the reason why we um, started with the Georia as a, let's say, central point of exchange or integration of metadata and central point of uh, integration of data governance approaches. Um, so um, let's start with a bit of uh, um, how the data management evolved um, <clears throat> in the recent decades, and it's quite the same in, at Etruvia. Um, uh, there was one main um, <clears throat> uh, point in time when the data warehouse was invented. Uh, it was in 1988. Uh, Barry Devlin was the first one who used the term data warehouse. It was the first time when uh, someone says we, we cannot um, <clears throat> analyze data when the data is in uh, transaction-oriented and um, um, databases and, and, and uh, systems, so we have to pull them out of, uh, of those systems uh, to analyze them better. Um, so Barry Devlin uh, was the first one who used the term, and then, of course, uh, guys like Bill Inman and uh, Ralph Kim Kimball used the term and, and, and created uh, everything around the, um, <coughs> the architecture of uh, the data warehouse. Uh, and then somewhere in... Uh, 2011, I think it was, um, someone else invented, uh, says data warehouse is not enough for us. Data warehouse is, um, um, has some deficits and we need a new architecture and this is called data lake. Um, that's where we're still working on and that's the rise of uh, Apache Hadoop in that area um, um, as a data management platform and um, <coughs> um, that the, the most used platform uh, for data lakes. Uh, we've got also a Hadoop platform running, still running, um, <coughs> um, but we are also looking for new approaches and new architectures in the data area. And um, there are uh, uh, at least two of those new uh, uh, architectures coming, uh, came, coming out in the recent few years. Uh, that is uh, Data Fabric, uh, a term which is... Um, very strongly uh, propagated from IBM, mm, but also other companies uh, built on data virtualization technologies. And the second one, maybe a year later or so, it was um, <coughs> uh, it came out, uh, and it's called Data Mesh. So I can tell you, I would tell you a few details of all those uh, architectures and the benefits and the drawbacks of those um, architectures. So when we started with the data warehouse, I mean, uh, we are using all those animals as, as, as pictures for, um, for, for our uh, architectures. Um, <coughs> it's, it's like a, an old tortoise nowadays. Uh, the data warehouse, as I said, began at the end of the 80s um, and developed further and further. It's uh, based on um, um, uh, one big uh, system, the data warehouse. Um, w w when it started, uh, the, on the operational side, we most of the time only had a, like one, one uh, core system, like for, in our case, the core banking system, or in other cases, an ERP system or something like that on the operational side. Um, so we haven't got that much different systems there. And it was, at first, quite easy to integrate this data and few maybe external data or uh, data from, from, from uh, other uh, systems into a, a data warehouse, a central data warehouse. Um, most of the time this was batch oriented. Uh, that means that we have uh, um, normally once a day or in the night we have uh, batch, large batch runs uh, which um, updated the data warehouse. Mm. Uh, the data warehouse had one Big advantage, and the, that advantage is uh, that it was quite easy to govern the data warehouse. We have only a few uh, um, like ways to get data into the data warehouse, and we can govern this those ways. We have a one big data model, and um, <clears throat> we can take care of the data data model. Uh, um, 
and, and um, be, be aware that only relevant data comes into the data warehouse and so on. Um, but on the other hand, um, this was also one of the biggest problems of the data warehouse uh, because it doesn't scale. Um, <clears throat> we have a very, very complex data model in it, uh, normally third, third normal form, um, uh, and we have uh, complex and costly uh, ETL processes and every time we want to extend uh, the data warehouse uh, it's, it's, it's very very uh, <clears throat> it's a very high effort because we have to change the data model we have to um, develop new ETL processes or even uh, um, maintain existing ones and um, um, every, everything has uh, uh, is dependent on other parts of the model, and it's 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 very hard to um, to change those data warehouse. And that was the reason that it took ages to get new data in the data warehouse. And that was also the reason that we uh, like um, <coughs> invented at that days uh, the so-called data lake. Um, <coughs> data lake was a new approach to uh, and, and differentiates a bit of the data warehouse in the way that it. Um, uh, takes takes all the data it can get, uh, no matter how it's modeled, no matter of the schema. Um, just push it down and push, push it in the data lake, uh, um, and then we in, in the next step we um, put a schema on it and um, <coughs> uh, try to make sense of the data and try to analyze it. Um, <coughs> uh, it's it's more like those uh, <laughs> small little turtles uh, swimming in the in the lake. Um, <coughs> But you have to be, be aware that those, um, this data lake doesn't become a data swarm um, in that, uh, that uh, nobody knows what's in the data, uh, data lake and nobody knows uh, how to handle the data. And um, <clears throat> so um, what was even uh, or is even uh, difficult to do there is um, uh, having a, a, a governance on the data, data governance, uh, metadata management is not easy to do there um, because we have many, many uh, different sources uh, which we want to integrate. Um, on the operational side, we have uh, new, new approaches, new architectures uh, going into the direction of uh, microservice architecture, for instance. And uh, so we don't have only one system, but we have many systems which we have to integrate. We have more external data, for, for instance, social media data, market data, uh, which we have to integrate. Um, <clears throat> and this is not easy to control in a uh, data governance form. Um, uh, which data comes into the data lake. Um, so the, the speed goes up, uh, but the effort for the data governance and for metadata management, data quality management, things like that, um, um, is, is much higher there, at least if we do not manage to automate it. And that's our topic today. Uh, coming to the next two... Um, newer approaches, um, uh, the data fabric builds hi highly on uh, um, uh, data virtualization technology. Um, this is an idea that we should leave the data where it is and grab it for analytical purposes on the fly. Uh, that means we uh, have a, uh, um, a virtualization layer on top of it and we unify the data across the enterprise, but without moving it. Um, <clears throat> so we're doing all the stuff uh, on the fly. Um, um, this can be done also in multiple cloud environments, so it doesn't depend on uh, on-premise technologies or even limits to, to one cloud or whatever. Uh, it can, can take data out of multiple cloud environments and, um, <clears throat> and on-premise data, which we also have. Um, but the challenges there is, as I said, everything is on the fly, so we have to integrate and cleanse the data on the fly, and um, <coughs> that means that uh, this is way more complex to do than if we do it in a, like in a, in a batch environment, which we knew in the data warehouse. Um, <coughs> so what we need to, to have there just to do it on the fly uh, is that we have uh, some 
governance policies there, um, for instance, that we have uh, a common way of identifying objects, uh, identifying business objects, uh, that's, that's one point. Um, uh, we t have to take care about this. Um, also, the polyglot storage, that means we have different sources there uh, with, with different uh, kinds of um, interfaces like APIs, or we also have to integrate event streams, we have to integrate SQL databases, and of course, files as well. Um, <clears throat> that's a big challenge. Uh, also, performance is an issue. Uh, you can imagine if we let all the data where it is and we have to integrate it on the fly, um, uh, that this is uh, this this can be a performance bottleneck. Um, performance was one reason in the data warehouse and data lake architectures that we put everything uh, um, uh, move the data in another um, storage technology. Um, this cannot be done here. I mean, the tools uh, provide caching mechanisms to um, work around these performance problems, um, but you always have to monitor uh, the performance to uh, like decide which uh, caches you have to create and things like that. And the last one, which is, I must say, my favorite, is, uh, <laughs> is uh, data mesh. Does anyone know data mesh? Some do, some not. Um, data mesh is a quite new approach um, to, to manage data and which goes in the direction, uh, uh, in the same direction as now the microservices architectures or the, or the domain driven design approaches which we have on the operational side. Um, <clears throat> it says leave the, let the data, um, not leave it physical there, but let the data be managed by the domains, by the business domains. It's, uh, it, well, it's built on four pillars, and the first one is the domain-oriented data ownership. That means uh, every domain should have its own um, <coughs> way to manage their own data, because they know the data best, they know how to interpre interpret it, uh, they know how to, to work with the data, uh, and... Um, <coughs> So they should be responsible for the data and they should own the data. Um, but how can they do that if they're not very like, data-oriented? Uh, um, they must have a platform, and the platform must be as simple as possible for them. Um, so a self-service data platform is the second pillar of a data mesh architecture, uh, <coughs> which must be... Uh, as sophisticated as possible so that uh, <clears throat> even people who d doesn't know a lot about uh, simple, simple application developers who doesn't know a lot about data management can work with this platform. Um, the third one is uh, data as a product. Data as a product is, uh, um, as we heard in the keynote uh, from Angel Dias, was it? Uh, w one of those three principles be, be product centric, and um, that's the same with uh, with data. You should see data as a product. Uh, you should um, handle data as a product. Uh, um, <coughs> you should uh, define uh, service levels for the for the for your data product. You su should define um, <coughs> uh, how to use the data, uh, and so uh, we, we create this bundle of a data product, so-called data product, which is one um, uh, <coughs> deployable unit and consists of uh, the data, of course, but also code to, uh, pipeline code to um, uh, transform the data, uh, and, uh, and of course, metadata. Uh, so you should describe your data products as well as you can uh, in form of metadata. Uh, that means also that the data products are in the domain, in the business domains. That means that this, that this is also at least logically uh, separated, uh, which is, of course, a um, special challenge for data management and data governance, for instance. Um, and um, that's where we come to the 
fourth pillar of data mesh is the, um, uh, the federated computational governance. Uh, federated computational governance means that, first of all, all business domains should uh, define a, um, a set of policies, data governance policies, which everyone has to follow, um, <clears throat> but in a federated way. Not there's, there's only one um, department who's defining uh, all the policies we need, but uh, everyone, every business domain defines policies, global policies together, and local policies for their own domain. Uh, and uh, the second term, computational, means that those policies should be uh, described in code and executed uh, on all the pr uh, data products it's itself. Um, that means that we have automation there and we shouldn't uh, define policies which we cannot check automatically. So um, this is an approach, uh, as I said, my favorite, um, and we are trying to implement this in at, at Truvia currently. Um, um, we're, I think, in a, in, in a, in a good progress there. Um, uh, and we uh, use Geria for, for, for this approach um, to do all this metadata management stuff and the federated computational governance with it. <coughs> okay. Um, that's it from a high-level architecture discussion currently, and I will now pass to David um, to uh, inform you about how we can use Ageria for the data governance, metadata management stuff in those architectures. Thanks, Jürgen. So I'm going to tell you a bit about Ageria first, and then we can apply it to what Jürgen's uh, just talked about. Um, I'll put on the picture of Ageria. The problem that a lot of organizations find is that they have lots of silos of data, different, owned by different vendors in vendor formats, often locked into applications, so it's the only way, there's only certain ways of accessing that, uh, that data through the application, through specific um, job roles or, or the like. What um, they find is that they're being asked to get a, um, to govern all of their data. They're being asked to surface their data for analytics, whether or not it's come from one vendor's um, application or another, or it could be a graph database, or it could be API information. You want to be able to handle, be able to see all of this, be aware of what you have. Can I see all my data sort of question? And without having to go to the, to the DB2 log, then go to the Hadoop person, and then have an access, then talk to the ETL uh, engineers about what they're doing as well. So the idea behind Ageria is that um, it has to be open, because if we said, if a vendor came up with it, and it might be Google, then maybe Microsoft would say, I'm not going to work with Google's one, I want to work with Microsoft. Or, and if IBM did it, there'll always be another vendor there that would say, well, why don't you put it into ours? So it has to be open source. So open source, where it's a collaboration of people, um, um, organizations that think this is a good idea, um, so that nobody is unjustly put down Everybody is equally dealt with, which... Um, so, in fact, I think we're actually dealing with the data in a similar way that we would deal with open source in an open source community. We're trying to, to deal with them with respect and be able to, to see them. So, what the, the idea is that you would... Um, we define a set of types in Nigeria for things like assets, policies, glossary terms, tables, relational code tables, columns, and it's in a standard sort of vendor agnostic, the technology agnostic way. It's just assets, relational columns. And the idea is that everybody maps there. When I say, well, if you wanted to be part of the Ageria ecosystem, you map your third party um, tables and columns and assets, and et cetera, to the Ageria um, versions of those. So you think, well, what's the point in that? <laughs> Well, you get two advantages for that. This means that you can easily integrate. So instead of doing all of those traditionally difficult point-to-point -point integrations, you've now got a common language which you can integrate, use to integrate. So um, this is actually a peer-to-peer -peer 
architecture. So there's no central place for, uh, for the Algeria information. It's a peer-to-peer, -peer, and, and the peers would represent different metadata repositories. Because what we're talking about is metadata, the metadata that describes the patterns that um, um, all the things that we're using. The other big advantage is we've got it now in a standard form. You could query Ageria, an Ageria API and say, give me all the assets, give me all the tables, give me all the glossary terms, and you don't need to know where they live. So uh, they're the two big advantages. So using an Ageria API gives you that view across your organization's data. Um, and we can sort of see it underneath the, um, this, this sort of layer is the metadata highway, we call it. Underneath it is the sort of technical metadata, the sources of metadata, um, which may have the odd connections between them. But of course, the way that you want to consume it is at a business layer. So we have things like data science um, APIs. We have DevOps APIs. We have asset owner APIs. So we, um, because the, the objects that are um, used for integration and to allow these things to integrate are fine-grained objects. And the way we want to surface them is in business objects that would make sense to the, the user. So that's the sort of the idea behind Ageria. And the more people that get involved with this, um, the more, the richer the whole environment is. So this is, um, we've been trying to use as many animal metaphors as possible because <laughs> that was our remit, it seemed, from the title. So um, we've got turtles again. Uh, the idea that if we wrench out the data from the application where it lived before, it had a whole series of um, protection while it was in that application. You could only get into it in a certain way. Only certain roles could access it. It was maybe a marketing thing. But now we wrench it out. It's now, it's like a turtle without a shell. It's vulnerable. So we have to re-establish that protection in some way. Um, so we, yes, we want to grab everything out, but we don't want to have um, everybody seeing everything um, and, and the like. So the idea is we have a big Ageria shell. I'm just thinking, so a, a big Ageria shell that would uh, <laughs> go over this, the, these, this vulnerable data such that we um, would be governing it and protecting it in a standard way. Um, in a coherent way, so you can apply policies across your data consistently rather than having to deal with it, each one of the shellless turtles individually. So this is a way of um, managing and governing your data co coherently using Ageria. So going back to Jürgen's picture, um, I thought, when I first looked at this, I thought maybe the the one, the second one replaces the first one. Maybe the third one replaces the second one, because it's an evolution picture, isn't it? But in actual fact, organisations don't get rid of, um, don't get rid of the things. They have a, a warehouse. They tend, they still have warehouses. We have um, data lakes. We still have data lakes. We might have new data meshes, but this is, it doesn't suddenly replace all of these things. The business has to continue is actually we've got these disparate patterns of technology, never mind different types of technology, and um, we want to do coherence sort of governance over them. But if all of these people in the chain speak Ageria, in a, I'm just using that as a, uh, we can go into more details about what that actually means. If they all um, uh, speak Ageria, then we've got a way of seeing them all in a standard way allow them to integrate the data which is in the different places. And um, we do that using these open types. We've got types that describe everything we think is necessary for an information management in a governance system. And we've had quite, it's, be, it was based on some open standards at the time, and it's extendable. You can add your own types, but we want people really to agree as a consensus in the community that this is the way we view the world. And they're all versioned, and um, so you can, all the, these types of versions. So you can make, back, you can, can make backwardly compatible changes to these types. So, um, but the idea is we have a, a rich language that describes everything we think is important. And if there's an area we haven't quite looked at yet, say um, 
CICD pipelines. There's probably metadata around that which experts will come around in the community and then propose new types. So, of course, we want our elephant in there, so Hadoop says, and me, so I can talk Algeria too. <coughs> so this is a question about, this is sort of a way, that one of the ways that we're sort of thinking about um, this stuff. We, we have data, and this just looks like um, a series of numbers and letters, and we can recognize some names, we can maybe recognize an address there. But this is really data that we don't really understand. What we then, to try and make sense of it, we have um, technical schema that we put on cross of that, structural metadata to say, well, the first part means a name. We have impno, job code, salary. This is sort of schemas that you might expect in, say, a, 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 um, a table uh, in DB2, for example, or in, in Postgres. And often they're written for the purpose of the writer. So they've called it empno because they know that this is empno, whatever that means to them. But of course, um, the way a lot of companies work is they, they want to make these things meaningful for the users. So they have vocabularies, glossaries, which are useful to the actual business. These are the words the business use. And if you work at a semantic layer, then you can say, well, an employee has a, a manager, an employee name. So these are sort of two ways of viewing the organization. Some people, the, the technical data engineers are in the weeds. They will be working at the structural level. But when we're looking at trying to expose things and, um, to the business users, often these um, uh, glossaries are so useful because you're being taught to in the language that you know for your domain. Say if it's pharmaceuticals, you have pharmaceuticals words, which I would understand, but, but it's tailored for that, for, for consumption. And then we can map from the, the, the structural metadata up to the, um, to the glossary terms. So we've got these ontologies at the top, and you could have something like annual salary that we're going to be dealing with in a certain way in our, our policies. And um, that annual salary could be mapped to a 1,000 different tables, entries in an API, could be content within um, an, an event. But we, we, it doesn't matter really where it is technically. We just want to govern that information in the same way, because at the end of the day, its meaning is a salary. And we can, we can get hints as to how to do that governance by saying different things are, by saying things are sensitive. So we have the concept of classifications. Is, we don't actually have a sensitive one, but we have, we, can go, we could go through into the details exactly what the, the types of um, governance classifications we've got. Things like retention is in there, criticality, confidentiality, and we have different levels of those. So sensitive is was just for the purpose of, as of this. So I think I've hinted at this. How do you, um, how do you integrate with Algeria? We talked about you have the third party um, information technology, and you have the Algeria concepts. And we map between them. And once you've done that, you get all the advantages we've just talked about. But going into a bit more detail, um, we have these two types of what we call connectors. We have a connector framework, which is a, um, a very, everything in Nigeria it pretty much uses these connectors and the connector framework. Everything is pluggable. So even the Kafka that we use by default is pluggable to, to be able to, just by the way that we've written everything. So you can plug, everything is pluggable. So. <laughs> From the, um, from the way that these connectors are. For, we can have embedded connectors as well. So it's a very sophisticated connector framework. Um, but for this, we have two types of connectors, uh, an integration connector and an a adapter repository connector. So I talked about the Ageria ecosystem, which is this group of um, uh, what we call cohort members. They live together in a cohort, and as one of them gets metadata, it can publish it, you can, it, it can send out that, that metadata um, to the rest of the cohort. So they, you, can, you don't have to take all of it. So by being part of the Ajira ecosystem, you can be enriched with data which other people in the ecosystem have. So if you want that to be the case, you have to actually be a member of the cohort. 
and this, the, the lower um, pattern, this adapter repository, um, is, the, is the pattern that you would use. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. If you want to go more detail, come, come afterwards. Um, the other type of um, uh, connector is the integration connector. <clears throat> and that means I don't want to be part of the, um, the Ageria cohort. I'm just going to put all of my data into one of the members of the cohort. Or you, it's actually a two-way um, connector. You can, you can actually bring information out from the cohort, or you can push it, push it in. Or you could do both. Um, so there's, that's the second style. These integration connectors are very easy to write. Um, we, we wrote two or, th is it three we've done now? Three, and uh, we've done, the early ones were done within a matter of weeks. Um, these, the, it's a very easy thing to be able to bring in um, schema information, asset information. Things, if you, if you imagine how difficult um, doing point-to-point -point integrations has been in the past. I mean, it can be a nightmare. It can be you do imports, things get stale, nobody owns it. <laughs> it's between the two, even if it's you own both products. We've all, well, I've, I've experienced that multiple times in my career. You probably have experienced that as well. And it just dies on the vein, on the, and nobody wants to look after it. Whereas we're concentrating here, and Nigeria is doing the heavy lifting for you, and the frameworks are, are doing all of the heavy lifting, like I say. So I'm just going to... We've got about four minutes left. Um, are there any questions up to now? No? OK. I'm going to whip through just very quickly, because the title was The Elephant. So that was big data. So we're going to whip through some of the detailed ways that we have um, we, we, we can bring in big data. So first of all, we've got the Hive Metastore connector. So we've got a way of. Um, an, it seems that many um, products have a HMS API. So there's the H using HMS if you're using it with Hive, but PrestoDB has one, Glue has one. So it seems HMS seems to be a common API these days to, to expose metadata. Um, it's quite an old one. Um, so we've, do we've done a Nigeria connector, um, and uh, it polls for information. And it, is, um, it also listens. This we've got, we can put a Nigeria listener within the Hive Metastore to pump out events as things change. We've got Apache Atlas. Um, we originally started doing this part of ODPI, is, uh, was where um, Apache Atlas sat. We started doing this sort of open metadata work in Apache Atlas in the big data space. But then we, we, took a, we, we actually moved away from them. And we thought, well, we, we don't just want to do big data. We want to do everything. Um, and Apache Atlas is still doing big data. And we have a connector for Apache Atlas. So there's some more animals we managed to bring in with falcons and uh, bees. And it uh, looks like a whale on the top <laughs> for HBase. And uh, um, the, the elephant's there. <laughs> so we've got the elephant at last. Um, so that's Apache Atlas. Because it consolidates all of the um, uh, metadata into a metadata catalog, and, and then we can just um, bring that information into Ageria. Then we've got something called Open Lineage. I just wanted to mention. So we've got data repositories, but data is moving between them. Um, the ETL jobs, other sorts of other sorts of jobs with the movement of data. So in the same way that everything, one minute, okay. OK, in the same way that um, um, Algeria all spoke the same language, well, we can all, spoke, all speak open lineage, um, which is a, I won't go into the details because I've not got any time. <laughs> um, but you can, if you can admit, and if you can talk the open lineage way, then you've got a standard way of seeing the lineage across all of this language. That's another LF um, project. And the last one was we have a JDBT connector, so you can connect it to. Um, Hive SQL, you could do it to Spark SQL, which is also part of the big data, or any other um, JDBC interface. Um, if you want to contact us, um, then, oh, it's actually on the bottom, that site is the, that's the website, nigeriaproject.org. 
Uh, we've got Slack channels. We'd love um, more people involved with the community. If there's something connector you need, um, so you, we could work with us to, to help that happen. So thank you for listening. Thanks. Any questions? So you can. Yeah. with um, images. Um, it depends what you want to do with an image. I mean, obviously, images have um, metadata associated with them, so they're self-describing. I don't think we haven't got anything particularly for images, but if you had a use case around how that metadata might be useful in a wider context for governance, then it would be a reasonable thing to put into Ageria. And it might be that you wanted locations, or you might want to associate an image, say, with um, um, a person, that was a glossary term. So we, we can store those sort of things. Was that the question or? <laughs> yes, uh, in, in an example, uh, yeah? if, if we have our own cloud um, with a lot of image and uh, a, a practical example with the, um, if we, Uh, the difference, uh, they, if the image is a cat or a dog, for example, not if, All right. if I, I have a, 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 a PyTorch. Uh, uh, so are you, are you talking about um, um, when you run um, machine analytics against an image, you can say, ah, that's an elephant, or that's a cat, or that's a dog. Um, that sort of processing is um, was not in Nigeria. The sorts of things that we would be looking at, because we're, a meta, we're all about the metadata and the integration of the metadata, not the actual data. But if there's metadata associated with that, that would be reasonably to, to reasonable to publish into Nigeria, such that you can see it in the wide. And, the ga and what you benefit from it, we see it in context of the meaning for the glossary term. And then potentially you can, so you've got ways of making sense of potentially that, that image. If you'd worked out it was um, Felix the cat, and Felix the cat already had um, a glossary term, said Felix the cat, you could link them together, and then you would have found the um, image. There is some interesting work about how you can generate metadata automatically, potentially using AI, but that wouldn't be a Jiria. We would be a recipient of that metadata to store it so that, such that you can govern it in context. And we don't store data. We only st we're, we're all about the metadata. Policies and glossary terms, whether you view that as metadata technically, but it's, we, we do those as well. Does that help? Any other questions? OK. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yes? I think there's a... OK. Um, so I liked your slide uh, where you described how, um, you know, Data lake doesn't necessarily replace data warehouse, doesn't necessarily replace other things. Yeah. Like in large organizations, they can have multiple. Yeah, they probably um, will, yes. And they, yeah, probably will. Um, and you described you know, um, the integration. Uh, and there was another term as well. It was kind of like a grouping. Um, if you integrate Ageria with, let's say, something like, like BigQuery, uh, mm -hmm. And that organization, let's say, already has many integrations, uh, data pipelines going all into BigQuery. Um, I guess at what place does, are you suggesting that Egeria helps replace data pipeline? You know, it becomes very confusing. At, at what layer is the data all connecting? You know, if you might already have data flowing into like a warehouse and just trying to like play so, out how that. Yeah, should look like. Uh, I'll, I don't know if I'll. I don't know if this should. There's probably just ways of doing things and consequences, <laughs> I would say. But Ageria, I like to think of is is not a replacement. It's not an or. It's an and. It's it's in addition. So you can carry on doing exactly what you were doing before. And if you're part of the ecosystem, then you can be enriched by being part of the cohort. So all you're doing is gaming. You're you're just the same UIs, the same interface, everything. Everything you did before, you can still do. 
So um, I w Algeria isn't replacing pipelines. It's, it could be um, bringing in lineage information I from see. those pipelines, so be it design or operational. Um, I didn't go into the open lineage, but that's operational lineage. But we have support for design lineage as well. And we've got quite, uh, and if you're interested in that sort of thing, which some of us strangely are, you can have, um, uh, there's quite a, a good write-up on, uh, on lineage, the description of what it means, the types of lineage, stitching lineage from different places. So once you've got it in a standard Ageria format, you can stitch lineage so that you can have a bit from this system, a bit from that system, a bit from, so you can actually see it in the same way that you can have a consistent view of your data, you could have a consistent view of your lineage from these disparate systems, which would be quite difficult if you weren't using standardized formats, open formats, because you'd have to understand each vendors or each, the technology behind the way it's actually, the format they use, as opposed to just knowing what it means because they've mapped to the open formats. I see. Does that make that sort of yeah. <laughs> answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Any other? Oh, very good. Thank you. That's okay. So uh, um, you mentioned the AWS Glue and um, you know, other uh, yeah. data uh, integration platforms. So the question is: um, So Jury is specific to metadata. You're not actually moving data. Uh, why would uh, we not use the regular data integration platforms to integrate also metadata? Why would we marry them together with Ajuria? What would it uh, give us? What kind of I think it just gives you the wider context. A wider context, uh, we're not tied to a particular technology. So often a particular technology, say for example, might be a graph database or there might be a data cat. There's, a, there's an example which Atruvia had, they have, um, three different catalogs. They had an API catalog, an event catalog, and a traditional database catalog, um, all with the different types of metadata. How are you gonna make sense of those three together, which all have very relevant information that you, the business needs to see the connections. Nothing can really store that, those relationships easily, but Algeria, what well, Algeria brings you the ability to be able to see them all in together. So you're basically abstracting that away? And, you know, um, abs um, not, not in a way that it's the lowest common denominator. Okay. Uh, so it shouldn't be losing detail. And, and if it is losing detail, and it's net, then we can always extend the types um, as a community if we think that there's a, a need for that. But we can still, it doesn't replace anything that you have. It's, I would just concentrate that it's an and. And the and that you're getting is integration and the end that you're getting is also a coherent view of all of your information assets. Thank you. Okay, thank you, good question. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. yeah? How, do you, how do you guarantee that it, that it works in all cases? And if how you, do yeah, how do you guarantee if, uh, uh, that it works in all cases? or in all applications, works, or business, or because there are different business, uh, so it's a different uh, structure business always. So I, the question is, I think, um, how do you guarantee that this will work for all businesses? Because I think in the technology landscape, uh -huh. which I think we mostly are, we've done most of our work with, database is a database. Mm -hmm. It's got tables, it's got schema, it's got an asset, it's got a name, it's got descriptions maybe, um, it's got foreign keys. Now, within that class of databases, everything that's a database is basically going to be a subset of that, uh, and like a child of that. Um, it might have slightly more functions if it's Postgres, or uh, it might have slightly more if it's DB2, but basically, tables and columns. And the same with APIs, the same with all this technical metadata. And if there's a new type that we didn't have, that we, then we would create a new thing for this new technology. Now, in terms of business, that's the technology layer. If you think above the Algeria line, the business um, is not concerned with tables and events and APIs. It's dealing with, so one way you might be able to do that would be with um, the glossary, would be an ontology, might be the approach. But you can have business objects, of course, within analytical reports as well. 
is that that's that's the way that I think where all the flexibility could come in. Does that you make sense? In, uh, uh, when you define your business terms, you do that in the glossary. Okay. So, you, so that's uh, where you differentiate between the different domains. Okay. So you define your glossary and then you link it to technical assets. Yeah. And then you can find out uh, which asset meets what in the business domain. Okay. Or, a or a schema element, if it's at that granular. Well, I think we're running out of time. Is there any last question that anyone has? It's, um, anyone can um, come and ask. We can go outside and talk more about it if you want to. Get involved with the community, or if you're um, thinking of adopting Nigeria, that'd be we'd love to talk to you. If not, well, thank you for all the questions. <laughs>